Yeah, hello. So my name is Mike Ausenhoff uh, from Germany. I'm going to tell you about uh, Barrios open source backup. Uh, first of all, who of you who has heard about Barrios before? No one. Who has heard about Bacula? Uh, okay. Some people are using it even. Are you using Bacula? Or? Uh, okay. Okay. So um, yeah, um, Barrios is a open source fork of uh, Bacula. I'll tell you later what, why we uh, saw the necessity to uh, establish a fork. I'm going to tell you what uh, Barrios is about, what are new features, especially compared to those uh, already in Bacula, and tell you something about our open source uh, strategy and, and the build process we, we are using. So we're doing everything after the check-in to the, uh, the source code repository, everything that comes after that uh, is completely automated. So uh, why, why did we uh, make, why did we start the fork? Um, Maybe you've heard about uh, Becula Enterprise, so there's a, a company called uh, Becula Systems and they have a product, Becula Enterprise, which is uh, set on top of the Becula community version. And um, uh, since a few years, uh, we, we have seen that only uh, that features were only um, developed in the closed source enterprise edition. And it uh, even happened that uh, patches that were submitted by community developers were rejected by the project leader for the reason um, that he said he wanted to have this feature only in the enterprise version, which is uh, not open source. And so what, what would a developer do that uh, uh, makes uh, such experiences? He starts his own fork and um, develops it and continues. And then um, yeah, at the end of 2012, we decided together with some developers uh, that it's time to have uh, an own product and launch, his, uh, launch it under the name. Barrios. So we are really 100% open source, it's uh, AGPL licensed. Um, Barrios is kind of backward compatible to Bacula. Um, this means that we can use, um, at least today, all old uh, Bacula configuration files. We can also use old uh, Bacula backup data. And you can use uh, some of the components uh, from Barrios, especially the, the client, together with the Bacula server, and vice versa. So it makes it very easy to, um, to migrate. Yeah, and then we had to find a new name because Bacula is a registered trademark. Um, we did a lot of uh, code cleanup and refactoring. Um, and we've um, developed a lot of new features, which we will see later. So here are just two, two graphs. Um, uh, this is uh, Google Trends about Bacula. There was a peak around 2007, and that was more or less the time when they started to have these enterprise uh, closed sourcing. And after that, we see declining interest with Google Trends, and we have similar graphs if you analyze the uh, traffic on their mailing lists. Um, uh, we started at the beginning of this year, and in, in February, this graph started in April. These are the um, unique visits to our downloadbarrios.org site. Uh, which was in the last week 3,800. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that we have 3,800 new installations per week because there are also Ubuntu machines uh, who are using the repository and, and check every day if there are uh, updates or whatever, but it sees um, increasing interest. So, um, overview about Pareos. We have all common features of uh, user network backup systems. Um, and all that that's given here is also true for, uh, for Becula. So that's nothing new, but uh, for those of you who haven't uh, worked with Becula before, or not even with Barrios, maybe it's good just to know what, what it is about. So it's a uh, network backup system. That means you have uh, clients for all kinds of uh, operating system, which you install on your Windows, your Mac OS, or your Unix Linux machines. And then you do um, a backup to a central uh, kind of repository. And you can have uh, very complex schedules, so the usual thing that you do, like a full backup each month, and then every week a differential backup, and every day an incremental backup to keep the amount of transferred data comparably slow. But that's um, true for almost every network backup system. What is kind of special and that does not have every backup software is a virtual full. Um, that means, uh, especially for um, environments where you have network traffic limitations um, that you do not every month a new full backup. But what you do instead is you use your existing backups and uh, virtually create a new full backup of the existing backups which you make 
Uh, so of, of course you have one time you make a full backup and then do the incremental backups over time. And then each month you go and take all these existing backups and create a new full backup from the existing backup systems. It means that you don't have to transfer all the data again. So that is uh, not very common. Um, then we have an inventory of all the backup files with uh, checksums, with dates, um, and that's in a database, usually MySQL or Postgres. Um, you can do restores via a command line interface or a web GUI or a QT GUI, and of course you can restore it to any other um, machine, not only to the machine where you originally got the file from. Um, we have encryption, that means we can encrypt the files on the backup client, and then they are encrypted, stored on tape or whatever. Uh, we can encrypt the, uh, the transport. We have access control lists, so we can restrict access to certain backup files. Um, we support all kinds of common medias like uh, disk, tape, tape libraries, or large roboters. And we will later on see a scenario where we can do a backup to the cloud. Well, last but not least, we have a scripting interface, so we can uh, execute scripts before and after running jobs, for example, for creating database dumps or whatever. Okay, so this until now is uh, nothing new. Um, a word about the uh, architecture, because we will use some of the words uh, later on. So we have the so-called director, that's, that's the central or the heart of the uh, Barbeo system. It's a server process, usually running on a Linux server. Then we have the catalog, that is a database. It could be on another server, but usually it's on the same. So then we have all the clients we back up. They are called a file daemon in various terminology. And we have a storage daemon, which is also a server process. And it is responsible for storing all the data to the various storage media like this, USB devices, library, cloud, or whatever. So in most cases, you have these three components, the storage daemon, the director, and the catalog on one machine. But if you want, you can separate it. So um, some features that we've uh, implemented with, with Barreos, which you won't find in, uh, in Becula. So one thing is um, hardware encryption. If you have uh, LTO drives, where you store your backup on, uh, starting with uh, generation four, those drives uh, support uh, hardware encryption. That means you load an uh, encryption key into your drive, and then the drive will uh, encrypt the data on the fly, which is very, very fast. Um, that is something that we've implemented. We have uh, client quota support, so we can say this client only has a certain amount of data to be backed. Um, we have NDMP support. NDMP is a storage protocol invented by uh, NetApp, and we can do a full backup and restores using that NDMP protocol. Um, then we have some um, enhancements that uh, make the life of administrators easier. Uh, for example, if you have um, a tape changer library and you do um, an archiving job where you want to export all the tapes from a certain job and put it to a uh, safe location, then uh, you, you now only have to issue one command and then you get all the tapes uh, which are related to the certain jobs and to the export slots. Before that, you had to do um, a, a kind of queries, find out which tapes belong to the job, and then issue a command, export this tape for, for all the tapes. And this makes it a lot easier. Um, then we have got some kind of deduplication. Uh, we have a bandwidth limitation. So if you have a network with um, yeah, not that much bandwidth, you can say the backup will only take uh, 10 megabits or, or something like that. And something that um, is uh, really useful if you do Windows backups, um, with, with Becula, you had to define uh, every single drive you wanted to back up. Um, and this means if you put another drive into your uh, Windows box and you had to change the configuration and have to add a, a drive to D or E or whatever. Um, and another thing is uh, if you have several Windows machines which you want to back up, they usually don't are, um, are unique. So one has two drives, one has three, and that, that means that you had to have a different file set definitions for each single Windows machine, and now you just have a directive that says uh, backup all local drives of that machine, so, which makes it a lot easier to backup Windows machines. Um, then we have worked a lot on the um, standard configuration, which is shipped with, um, with our product. Um, 
So one example in, in earlier days and uh, still with, with Becula, uh, if you do a backup to disk, the backup files are written to the slash temp directory, which is not that good. If you do a reboot, they sometimes are lost. So that is was just one example where we thought we wanted to make it um, as easy as possible for people trying out to work with values. And uh, so today you just have to install and then it does something reasonable. It backups some reasonable uh, directories and has a scheduler which is um, quite uh, usable. Okay, so uh, I don't go in detail what, what we did with, with the scheduler. One thing is useful, um, if you define your schedule uh, where you say, um, let's say for example, first Sunday in the month you do full backup and second to fifth you do a differential and so on, um, and you uh, code this in your configuration file, so then you start your backup system and after some weeks you, you may encounter, okay, um, there, I did a mistake in my configuration and the backup job didn't run as expected. Um, and to handle this problem, we have uh, a so-called scheduler preview, so we can say, please give me a list of all jobs that are running over the next n days, and that makes it a lot easier to verify your configuration things. Um, yeah, then one thing, dynamic loading of catalog backends, um, that means that you can uh, change, or we have different packages uh, which address My MySQL or Postgres and you don't have to um, define it compile time which you want to use, so we, we just ex uh, change packages and then you can use other backends. And then we are using the uh, uh, open build service, does anyone know who the open build service? No using. Um, we will see it later, that is um, um, service office, uh, offered by SUSE, which is uh, free, you don't have to pay for it. Uh, you can upload your sources and then you get uh, packages and ready to use repositories for a vast variety of uh, Linux distributions. And we are using the open build server as an own instance, so you can download it and uh, use it by yourself. And we are building um, ready to install um, repositories for so all major Linux variants. We uh, also built um, the Windows client with a cross compiler. Um, fully automatic with the um, open build server, um, while the Mac packages are built uh, manually. They, we haven't found a way to turn out to build it with the open build server. But that goes all um, automatic. Um, two features which are new with the version 13.2 that is today in beta status but will be released uh, within the next weeks. That is um, so-called backup replication. So if you imagine you have a scenario you want to first backup to disk and then maybe to tape, that is something you could uh, already use with uh, do with so-called copy jobs. The only restriction is that you have the storage team, the server process are running on some machine and you could only uh, do copy jobs f uh, from, from and to backup media that are connected to, to the very same machine. So that's okay if you imagine this is a disk and this is a tape drive, so this works. But what you could not do is um, replicating jobs to another storage team, which sometimes is quite useful if you have, uh, let's say, two data centers and uh, want to have your backup in a separate uh, segment of your building or even uh, another um, location. Uh, so that's possible now, and if you uh, replace this Cricket wall here in your mind by a cloud, and you could also do a, the same way a backup to cloud if this is a cloud provider having the storage team running on uh, as a cloud service, and you could backup it, it there. And um, that's not for security reasons, no problem uh, um, as long as you encrypt your backups. So, but then it's, I think it's a reasonable way to do so. There's, of course, two, two um, restrictions. So one is time, uh, if you do a backup to cloud and really have a disaster recovery and have a slow uh, line, it may take some days until you get your data back. And um, the second is, I forgot the second one. Okay, maybe it comes, comes back later to my mind. So, uh, it costs, right, a lot of people think, uh, okay, do a backup to cloud, it's uh, much, uh, much more economic than buying a tape library. Uh, but is that is not always true. Uh, that's true if you store your backups for, let's say, a few weeks or months. That, that might be economical, but uh, a lot of people say, okay, I have to do long-term storage, like 10 years. I don't know how it's in France, but in Germany, if you take the, uh, the law word by word, you have to make sure that you have 10 years backup of all your business-related data. And if you um, 
start doing long-term archivation in, in the cloud for 10 years and then uh, really calculate the investment in a tape library and uh, tapes, then it will in most cases turn out that the tape library on-premise on will be much more cheaper than the to cloud. But for a lot of small business, that might be quite interesting. Um, then there's one thing we call a uh, passive client. Uh, sorry for the German text here in the, in the graphic. Um, um, that's, that's a problem if you make a backup of a server that is, let's say, in a DMZ. So you have your internal network here with your director and the storage daemon. And then the usual way is the director connects to your machine, your file daemon, which you want to backup. And the file daemon then connects back through the firewall to the storage daemon. And that's, of course, a scenario that you really don't want to have. You don't want to have con connection initiations from your DMZ into your internal network. And apart from that, you have problems with, uh, with nothing and uh, with name resolution. So it's um, not nice. And what we have made is a so-called uh, passive client. That is just um, adding one line to your configuration file. You say this client is a passive one. And that means that um, the file daemon will not try to initiate the connection to the storage daemon, but uh, it will work in a way that the director tells the file daemon, hey, um, wait, here's a storage daemon that will connect you in the next few minutes, uh, creates a one-time password, and then tells the storage daemon, you please connect to this file daemon with this credential, and then he initiates the connection and uh, retrieves all the data from backend. So that is something that we found quite useful, and a lot of users and customers were happy to, to have it. So, um, yeah, roadmaps of the 13.2 with all these new features, passive client and um, backup replication is um, in better state since, I think, uh, July. And it's really uh, pretty good. We only have small bug fixes and we expect it to um, publish within the next weeks. Um, actually, we are working on features that we will publish uh, next year, so hopefully. Uh, one is a configuration API, so that you can use um, like Python scripts to change your configuration. For example, add a client uh, by typing it on the command line and then uh, rewrite it back to your configuration. And we're making the plugin interface ready for Python. So um, we now have a, a plugin interface um, that is not easy to handle. You have to uh, write uh, the code in C and have some uh, hooks coming back to the, um, to the, to the daemons. And um, that's not very widely used, but uh, we want to make it usable with Python and that would make it much easier to write plugins, for example, to uh, backup or restore single files or whatever, because there are a lot of modules around uh, for Python for, for any use. And then we're actually working on a support for the VMware API so that we can um, trigger a snapshot of a running virtual machine and then, then backup the whole disk. And the second step is then that we will um, be able to do incremental backups of um, disk images um, so that the amount that you have to transfer to backup will be minimized. And then one thing that is um, already in the pilot set, we have one user uh, who is testing this in production, is a plugin for uh, Microsoft SQL, um, which allows point in time recovery. So it backups the, the, the whole backup and the redo logs, and then you can say, okay, I want to backup. I want to restore a backup from yesterday, 4 o'clock, and then it will restore exactly this, this state. So this will be, uh, this will maybe um, be published this year. So. So. Yeah, so open source, I said we are 100% we AGPL, we host everything on, on, on GitHub. So that means everyone can, uh, can make a fork and uh, try things and test things and then send us a pull request and, and if we see, well, it's a useful patch and it's uh, working, then we can uh, easily integrate it in the, in the feature, uh, in the, the product. And if we don't do, uh, then everyone can still uh, continue having his own fork and, and uh, develop his things. So that's quite useful. Um, yeah, we explicitly say that uh, if someone makes a fork, we really uh, honor this, we, we, we like it, and we say that's a sign that the community is, is right and people are working with it. So. Okay. That's about code contribution. So then uh, to, the, to the build process. 
we are using a lot of tools which we combine to have uh, it in a way that everything works fully automated. So after um, the patch is checked in into the master branch, a lot of things happen. We will uh, issue regression tests. We will um, produce documentation. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah, so maybe a lot of time for questions. Uh, we create documentation, we build the packages and the repositories fully automatically. We do uh, continuous integration tests for also other platforms. I'll show you details later. We have uh, nightly builds, so at least if someone has checked in something over the day, then uh, during the night uh, everything will be built and the repositories will be published so that if a developer has uh, submitted something, he can uh, directly test it the next day if it's uh, all working in the, in the product. And lastly, we build um, um, virtual images, which are completely pre-configured, ready to use, uh, out of the nightly build, so people can uh, just download a virtual machine image and start testing with it. So, how does it look in, in detail? So, regression tests. Um, we have uh, taken the original, roughly about 80 um, original regression tests from Macula. So um, the idea of the regression test is that you have uh, one, one test for each single feature. And um, because we have um, implemented a lot of new features and um, the existing 80 tests were not uh, comprehensive, we have extended to today about 130 uh, tests. And um, yeah, that are then executed whenever something is checked in. They are all uh, checked here, you see 130 here. And then we see the result. This, uh, by the way, is public, so anybody can uh, use uh, this back end or front end and see uh, how the last um, regression test did work. So, that is, by the way, is, uh, C dash. It's a very popular tool for regression testing. Yeah, I, I think most of you might have heard of Doxygen. Doxygen creates uh, documentation out of source code automatically. This is just an example from a graph, so that is also uh, created automatically. Um, then what you see here is a screenshot from the open build server. So as I told at the beginning, you can use um, the open build service provided by SUSE. You just have to create an account and then you can start building packages for any distribution they support. Um, but we have chosen to install our own open build server to be independent from, uh, from the load on the open source build service. So just, this just shows you um, some of the distributions which we support, CentOS, Debian, and here 32-bits um, 32 32-bits 32, 32 and 62-bits, and says succeeded for packages are built. Um, so and that's just the way it, it looks like in general. Um, anybody using Jenkins or knows what Jenkins is? Yeah, so Jenkins is an open source tool to do continuous integration tests. And what we do is, after we have built the packages using the open build server and the repositories, then we have for each uh, platform that we support, we have um, a Xen VM, a no, Xen virtual uh, template. And then Jenkins starts to work when he, says, when he sees there are new uh, repositories or new packages in the repositories. It clones a template for, for each of these uh, listed here. And there are some more today. Uh, makes, makes a clone, starts the machine, installs um, uh, the software from the repositories, and then does some checks like uh, creating a file, doing a backup and a restore, verifying that the, that the file has really been restored. Then we uh, check um, or we install the debug packages to be able to um, or to verify that uh, the debugging would work in case of a support uh, case. And then we uh, deinstall the software, and if that only uh, all works, then we have a green uh, line here. And we do this for all kind of um, combinations we have. So let's this example. This is uh, Debian with six and seven, 32 bits, 64 bits, and then we test um, if an uh, installation of a client only works. And test this against an external um, Barbados director, and we already install. Or we also install the uh, director itself and test certain database backends. So we have MySQL, Postgres, and SQLite. Uh, we test all these this combinations. So after this has run and everything is green, we really know, okay, the packages can be installed and uh, basic functionality is there. And plus the uh, regression tests that we've done before that are testing 
these 130 features. So after that, we are pretty sure that things work well. Um, yeah, then the last step is uh, we use uh, Super Studio. Anyone using that? this? It's also a free tool. You can just sign in and register. Um, and uh, through the studio builds um, um, virtual machine images in uh, very dis different formats. So one is your open virtualization format. You have VM there. You have open virtual box. Um, it creates ISO images, which you can use to automatically install a machine. Um, this bases on OpenSUSE 12.3. And all you need is um, a repository with packages for OpenSUSE 12.3. Then you can say, okay, here's your repository, and then you can add uh, some scripts which will configure um, the, the system, and then uh, you are ready and get your, your images here. So that, that is really cool if you want to test something very quickly, um, and it's really easy to handle. So um, if you want to just are interested in that, easiest way is uh, sign in at uh, Sula Studio, and then you can take any existing project there, like Vareos, click on Clone, and then you have your own first uh, project, and then you can look how they did it, and try to make your modifications. And in the end, um, and that's uh, the best thing, you, you don't even have to download the uh, virtual images and put it into your hypervisor. Uh, you can just click on Test Drive, and that gives you the uh, ability to test it online, so it will start somewhere in the cloud a machine and you get the interface here. So that's really a powerful tool. Yeah, big picture shows um, more or less everything I've uh, told before. So it starts here with a source code repository and um, ends here with the um, downloadbarriers.org where the repositories are created, so package repositories. Um, see the Jenkins thing, and okay, this is just to show the, the complexity. I think the um, open, uh, the uh, SUSE Studio images are not even included in that graph. Okay. So we are, of course, um, so one aim is to re-establish or reanimate the, the community. There are already some people coming in and providing uh, patches. Um, there's a lot of work to do, you don't have to necessarily dig very deep into the code. Um, there are things uh, around the core to do, like um, application backup plugins. So we, we hope when the uh, Python API is ready that uh, people will easily create uh, plugins that, for example, could backup IMAP servers and do a single mail restore. Um, do the same for Microsoft Exchange, for example or enhance uh, database backup. So I, I told you that we have some Microsoft SQL plugin already um, in production testing. Um, but of course, uh, for doing backups of, of Oracle, we wanted time recovery. So new, new plugins would help a lot. And then something that, um, that I uh, found very useful to have is uh, end user plugin or an end-user GUI, because today um, if an end-user wants to have a file restored, he usually calls the app and says, hey, I've got a file, please restore it. But uh, the idea is uh, that, that you have a context menu on the File Explorer in Windows, and on a directory you could do a right-click on a directory, and then it will show you which files would be available from the backup. So this is something that yeah, are just ideas of what uh, people could, could do for, for contributing. Um, yeah, we have a, a web GUI, um, which we haven't um, developed. It's a very old one called uh, vBecula, um, that hasn't been um, developed for some years. Uh, but we started to uh, reanimate it and, and use it. And I could also imagine that uh, people being interested could, could help there yeah, a lot. OK, then one word about um, Funding. There is a company behind it, this Vareos GmbA something, it's a special German uh, construct. It's uh, privately held, <coughs> was founded by uh, the, the main developers and some people, so I'm one of the, the co-founders. And uh, we sell a subscription and support model, so everything is 100% open source, so nothing with open core or enterprise distinction. Uh, everything we have here in the subscription service is built on the published um, uh, open sources. 
Um, we work together with, with partner companies who go to the customers, install it, help them do consulting and, and support, and we sell the subscription model. Um, until now, we don't have any partners in, in France, so maybe if someone is interested, just uh, give me a call. Okay, well, I think I'm quite a lot uh, in advance the timetable, so I'm finished here with my uh, presentation. Here are just the links. I don't know, do you publish the, the slides uh, afterwards anywhere? Uh, uh, yes, we published uh, the slides on the, website, on the website of the conference. Yeah, okay, great. So if, okay. I can say, uh, if I can send the slide. Uh, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, okay. So, yes. So barriers.org, that's the community page with documentation, downloads and uh, links to backtrackers and so on. Then we have silverlayers.com uh, with information regarding subscription, support, references, partner and certification, stuff like that. Um, yeah, GitHub of course, and we have a, a backtracker, it's also for feature tracking used. And some more pages, but you find all the links on, on one of these pages. So, uh, yeah, so I'm done with this part, maybe there are some questions. Yes, with uh, backup software, the biggest problem is always the robot. The what? The, the tapes, uh, the robot yes. that you have behind. Yes. And uh, do you support a lot of... Uh... Yes, um, so today most people have LTO drives, mm -hmm. and that's an industry standard. And yes, but LT is the tape, it's not the, the mechanical... Uh, so they work. The, 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 the robot, yes, sure, yes, yes, but then they are also uh, standardized, and uh, so I've never heard of any robot not working with, with Papyrus. So we, um, today we are preparing a certification process with uh, IBM, um, and we will hopefully finish it this year, but uh, technically it's over here, and the certification thing is more a marketing issue, but uh, we can expect that it works. And, um, we ship a little tool that tests all the needed functionality of drives and um, of robots. So you find it in the documentation if you attach it <coughs> and uh, run the testing script, it will test everything. And then, uh, but, but again, I've never heard that uh, any kind of library or didn't, didn't. At least none of those that were constructed over the last five or six or, or ten years. And maybe there are some uh, rare things. Out on market, but uh, what you find today will be supported. And how many um, um, storage nodes can you use? Can you use for how many storage nodes? Yes, you have, you have the, the node where uh, you have the DB and so on, and you have you, uh, the node with where you are, where all the tape are connected. How many uh, storage nodes can you use? Ah, you mean how many storage demons? Yes, yes. Um, to be honest, I don't know if there is, well, there will be some theoretical limit. Um, we have right now installations with two storage demons um, because there was never the need for more, but uh, I don't see any reason why there should be a limitation other than network bandwidth and, and, and hardware limitations. But, uh, so, do we have a, a special use case in mind? Not just. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. So, but usually you have. Uh, one or two or maybe three storage demons, um, um, there, there should be a problem with the usual use case frames. Okay, any other question? Um, about the database, uh, how are you backing uh, for the database? You just take the, the raw file and uh, just back it with the GitHub as a any other file or um, are you trying to uh, gather the structure the in structure of the database? Uh, depends on the on the database. Um, usually all databases have a kind of scripting interface to do a snapshot or a dump. So easiest way to, for example, back up MySQL is with pre-job, which uh, opens a named pipe and then does a dump of your database to the pipe, and then you use this pipe to backup and then you've got a consistent state of the database backup. Um, Oracle has the same as an all own mechanism, it's called RAM. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can also support this using pre and post scripts and there are also use cases. So, uh, for those of you being more interested, we have uh, once a year the open source backup conference in, in Cologne. Uh, you, you find it on the, on the internet and there are uh, papers, I think there's one especially, especially about uh, backing up Oracle. 
can find there. And for Windows, are you supporting VSSS? Yes. Yeah, the Windows client does support VSSS. And we also enhance other was not on the list. We've uh, spent a lot of time in the uh, Windows client. So one thing is that we can cross compile it. Oh, sorry. <coughs> one thing is that we can cross compile it using the old build server. And the other thing is that we've rewritten the installer from scratch. And you can now um, use it in a silent mode and give all parameters you need um, on the command line. And that means you can automate it for um, deployment tools like, like Opsi, if you heard of that. It's an deployment, open source deployment tool for Windows. And we have also Opsi packages for the Windows client. Yeah. So it does support for us as VSS snapshots. And we have some Maya, um, the MSSQL plugin, which also supports a point in time recovery. Okay. Thank you very much.